Welcome to Rejected Religion Spotlight. My guest today is Dr. Joel Bordeaux. Joel holds a PhD in religion from Columbia University and is currently a research fellow at the International Institute for Asian Studies located at Leiden University here in the Netherlands. Uh, his research interest includes South Asian and Himalayan religions, new religious movements, as well as esotericism, just to name a few. So welcome to Spotlight, Joel. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm very happy that you had time to talk to me today. Um, you've written a very interesting chapter about the occult dimensions of Grant Morrison's Batman comics. In particular, the initiation or death and rebirth of Batman in that story. And I am always on the lookout for uh, any any references to esotericism or a culture uh, in, in the uh, official term uh, of, of the occult in, uh, in popular culture. So when I came across your article, I was really hoping that you would be able to talk to me. So I'm really happy that we could set this up. But before we Me get too. into uh, discussing the article, uh, what inspires you to write about Batman? Um, well, uh, so it's not, I wouldn't call it an inspirational story, perhaps even. Uh, it's a, uh, it could be of interest still in the, um, how the academic sausage gets made uh, file. Um, <laughs> essentially, um, well, I have been. I have worked with comics a, a decent amount in my uh, teaching. In any case, um, so uh, I've used uh, parts of uh, Sandman for um, in some classes, and Promethea and others. Some of the um, the indie authentic series, and in, in other cases too. Um, but I hadn't written about much of any of it. Um, but uh, so this, the volume that this came out in the assimilation of yogic traditions and pop culture. Um, I believe was, uh, you know, it was parsed out in such a way. The, the editor had um, a particular balance in mind for um, articles that had to do with comics and had to do with television and so on. Uh, and apparently at the 11th hour or so, maybe the 10th hour, um, one of the comics uh, people had to withdraw uh, oh. for whatever reason. <laughs> um, so I got a call and it's sort of like, Hey, uh, you're into comic. You're a comics nerd. Like, do you, you want to do a thing? Uh, and I said, Oh, yeah, I think I could do that. And I started pitching things like, I could do this thing on like Yodorowsky's Inkal or whatever. And, and I, it wound up being this kind of game of like, you're getting warmer, you're getting colder. And so um, eventually I said something about Grant Morrison. And then the guy's like, Uh huh, yeah, yeah, Grant Morrison. And I was like, okay, I'll do the Invisibles. And he's like, Nope, no, 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 no. more mainstream, more mainstream. And like, Batman. It's like, Yes, that's the one. <laughs> So I assume that uh, my impression is anyway, there was already meant to be a chapter on, uh, on Grant Morrison's Batman. Uh, and I inherited the idea. I see. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it's good fun and sort of, uh, it's certainly one of the, the least uh, painful writing assignments I think I've ever had. I mean, just any day that you can wake up and sit down and, and read Batman and like, and legitimately claim that you're working is a pretty good day. <laughs> definitely, definitely. This is always a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so your chapter is entitled The Dark Knight of the Soul, Death as Initiatory Ordeal in Grant Morrison's Batman R.I.P. And in this uh, chapter, you explore the narrative of death and rebirth that Batman experiences in the mountains of Tibet. And in Morrison's comic, Batman must undergo an ego death but does so by self-inducing a fracturing of his personality, a, uh, a type of um, dissociative identity disorder of his own making, if, if you will. Uh, and Morrison uses Buddhist concepts in uh, their story, uh, and one of them begins with a T, and I'll let you talk about that and pronounce it because I don't want to <laughs> mangle it. But if you could discuss these these things more in more detail, and also why Batman is uh, is using all of these Buddhist uh, concepts in the story. Okay, yeah, um, sure. I think I can I can try to do that. Um, <laughs> Although it's it's extremely convoluted as as these things tend to be, they always are <laughs> both from Morrison and from you know <laughs> esoteric Buddhism. Um, so I mean I think the the easiest uh, thing to sort of um, 
to put on the table in some ways is that is the what is it doing in the Batman comics? And I think to a substantial degree, this is about uh, Morrison's own his narrative reasons for this and aesthetic and philosophical reasons. Um, one thing that he has expressed, I think, um, at various points in interest in uh, is this sort of a foundational superhero trope of the kind of secret identity, right? So that, that plays directly into this. Um, in particular, I think he one thing that he wanted to do with his entire Batman run was to try to find some way to integrate the, you know, dozens of different Batman that you have, right. From the, from the campy, you know, Adam West TV shows to the, you know, sort of grittier uh, Christopher Nolan. He he wanted to try to find a way to work all of those somehow into the same, to make them somehow the same character. Mm. Um, And that plays directly into his other sort of fascination with this idea of embracing this kind of, you know, uh, DID as a, as a solution to, you know, modern alienation. Um, he's played with this idea. This actually picks up a thread from his Arkham Asylum um, uh, one, one shot uh, that he did uh, some years previously. But, you know, this idea that essentially, you know, in a mad world, um, the only way that you're going to successfully navigate a mad world is to become mad yourself. And that could be a kind of super sanity or something. Um, so there are all these sort of aesthetic and uh, these reasons that have nothing really basically to do with Buddhism per se. Right. Um, but he did, he has said that he particularly wanted to use uh, this run of Batman to introduce uh, his readers to Dzogchen or to rather, I think he said something to the effect of to make them research it. Um, so he wanted to drop in at least enough that people would have to go and poke around and, and try to figure out what's going on with it. Um, so, I mean, the, the main ideas that he uses, I, I think there are, Funnily enough, they're, they're, they fall into two categories. One is the very, the most very basic uh, Buddhist notion um, that the, the idea of a, of a self as a permanent, inherently existing phenomenon is illusory. But. So in terms of the, the specific Buddhist content, uh, I think we can, we can break that into two basic categories. One uh, is, the, is a really foundational uh, notion and, and the other is is extremely rarefied uh, esoteric uh, meditation techniques, and he doesn't really get much of anything in between, which is kind of um, part of what I write about is all this uh, the things that he leaves out. Um, but so in the in the first instance, you know, we're talking about the the foundational kind of uh, insight that the the Buddha is meant to have had that the the self as we experience it anyway, um, as as if it were a, sort of a given as a um, it, it inherently existing permanent uh, phenomenon is, is illusory, that it's, uh, in fact, it only exists in dependence on these uh, various causes and conditions, um, karmic factors, and, and other more obvious things, like we have to have a physical, it has to have a physical basis, and um, you have to have feelings and perceptions and, uh, and karmic, uh, you know, causes uh, that give rise to it. So, you know, I think Morrison uses that uh, that basic idea uh, to underlie a lot of this um, this kind of intentional fracturing of the personality kind of narrative that he uses. That's what that's what makes that possible, right? If there were one inherently existing Batman, then none of that could have made sense. Exactly. Or for that matter, then Bruce Wayne wouldn't also really make much of any sense, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? So, um, but so there's there's that sort of found a uh, foundational notion, and then he sort of skips everything in in between the whole whole sort of edifice of Buddhist philosophy and jumps to what is um, at least according to the those people who uh, are practitioners of it um, the most uh, the most secret that the most um, intense and uh, highest level practice. Uh, within the the Tibetan tradition, uh, which is uh, it's called Dzogchen. It means the the great perfection. Um, And it styles itself as uh, a practice that sits atop, well, so in Indian philosophy in general, uh, there's a tendency uh, to say, um, instead of saying that other views are explicitly wrong, you you relegate them to that they're provisionally true, um, as a lower level of your own understanding of a, of a given position. Okay. So the tendency is just to rank things in terms of how right they are, okay. where right means how close are they to your own view. Um, <laughs> okay. so, so in this sense, you know, Dzogchen isn't really that different from um, from the way other uh, 
traditions deal with this, but uh, in a general sense, this is coming out of a tantric Buddhist uh, milieu. And so if you're talking about that already, you've got a situation where um, you have the, the Theravada, broadly speaking, form of Buddhism that's practiced in Southeast Asia, um, and the, the Mahayana, so the, the greater vehicle to the tradition of the elders um, in South, Southeast Asia, the greater vehicle, the great vehicle in East Asia, generally in Tibet, um, and the people in the Mahayana view the Theravada as a lower form. Okay. Within the Mahayana, um, there's a, another sort of split, and uh, there are tantric practitioners with the mat, and they tend to view the exoteric Mahayana as a lower um, form. And then within the tantric view, or like sort of even potentially sitting on top of it like a cherry on a Sunday are the Dzogchen people, and they say, well, even the tantric stuff is a little bit below what we're doing. Um, so what, what Morrison does is basically skips through all, all the intermediary stages and, and jumps right to the very uh, end. So <laughs> what Dzogchen tries to do, or, or what it claims to do, uh, is essentially um, to engage directly with non-conceptual, um, to engage the non-conceptual mind directly. It claims to bypass all the, the various meditative um, techniques uh, and the analytical philosophy and, uh, and introduce the practitioner directly to the luminous, um, inherent nature of, of consciousness uh, without an object. So uh, in practice, what, you know, this would only be something you'd ever get to having moved all the way through, uh, you know, lots and lots of intermediate stages um, and then having practiced the tantric stuff with all the visualizations and all the various rituals and then so on. But he picks up with um, the, the higher stages of, of Zog Chen um, with a practice called Tugal, um, which uh, means to leap over. So it's this idea um, that you're going to, it's the final jump, you know, into uh, the, the direct experience of the mind as a luminous. Uh, and so this happens, uh, some, there's a part of it anyway, for it has no techniques allegedly, but there are some techniques, of course. Um, part of it does involve something uh, called yangti, which is another thing that, um, that Morrison includes in the story, which is a, a dark retreat uh, where, you, where one locks oneself, so to speak, in a, um, in a, in a cave. Um, and there are visionary experiences which would occur. You can call it prisoner's cinema or however you want to think about that. But right, um, if people have ever done sensory deprivation, uh, you know, these things, these kinds of things will happen. Uh, these are interpreted within the context of Tugal as, um, as the natural luminescence of the mind manifesting. And so the visions that you encounter eventually, at least towards the end, are uh, perceived as a, a collection of 100 deities. Um, and when all of that sort of um, comes to its uh, climax, then you, you have a, a bursting forth of sort of enlightened consciousness. Um, so he, I think the, the thing that Morrison does in some ways here is he conflates um, two ideas, which are, which are very closely related. So the 100 deities that you uh, are meant to encounter at the end of this kind of sensory deprivation um, retreat are the same deities that presumably all of us will encounter at the moment of death. Um, so when uh, there's the, the Tibetan tradition talks about this thing called the bardo, the sort of between state, um, which lasts up to seven weeks or something uh, from when you die until the next time that you reincarnate. Um, or your consciousness reincarnates, right? Because you won't be you anymore. Um, but that, that continuum goes on. And, uh, and during this process, is, which is detailed in the so-called Tibetan Book of the Dead, there's a whole um, literature around this, uh, you will encounter supposedly these 100 deities. So I think what, what he's done is, because those 100 deities occur at the moment of death, supposedly, to everyone, and in the dark retreat, there are practices that are done that are meant to induce an experience of these deities, he has conflated the idea of the retreat and the, the dying experience uh, in the way that he depicts what's going on with Batman. So Batman in the this, in this story does this dark retreat in order, he says, to experience what death is like. Um, 
And so I think that's kind of where, um, that's what Morrison tries to do with it. It's, it's a reasonable, um, you can, you can imagine easily how he gets there. If, if supposedly phenomenologically, the experience would be somewhat similar. Um, but it's not how it would traditionally play out. Okay. I see. So, um, this is happening in the story uh, before he is uh, splitting his personality, or after. I guess it's before because he's doing all of his training in Tibet before he goes back. Correct. So he's getting his uh, mm-hmm. his foundation, and is this then the, considered the initiation for him? Yes. So in the story, it's. Um, I mean, there seems. Be- Potentially also to be time travel involved, so oh, it's a little right. um, buggy. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> These things can be uh, narratively what what appears to, if I understand correctly, what happens is um, there's a point earlier in the uh, in the run where um, Batman uh, subjects himself to just a regular bog standard sensory deprivation uh, experiments. So the doctor who who conducts this experiment for him uh, or whose experiments he participates in um, is uh, given the name Dr. Hurt. And there's some suggestion uh, that he may be the actual devil, um, Mm. which gives it a, there's a lot of strange sort of uh, Christian uh, things going on in the story as well. Um, But in the, um, he's a villain in any case. And as part of this, he uh, implants into uh, Batman slash Bruce Wayne's subconscious or unconscious mind. Um, the idea that he's killed Robin or he's done something that's got Robin killed and that he wants to retire from being the Batman. Um, and so this is supposedly the subconscious mind bomb or something, some kind of post hypnotic suggestion that's kind of lurking in the back of his mind um, to be activated later on with some keyword. Um, and when Batman goes to Nanda Parbat, which isn't exactly Tibet, but it's like mm-hmm. the sort of DC universe, right. uh, Nepal, Tibet stand-in place. Um, and he does this, uh, this Togal practice and experiences death. It's when it, it turns up this previous um, experience. Right. Okay. So that's how he discovers that he's been, uh, that there's been this bug planted basically. Mm-hmm. And at that point, he um, realizing that this is going to be a thing that, will happen at some point to him in the future, right? Mm-hmm. And Batman being, I mean, his whole shtick in a way is just that he plans for everything, yeah. right? So Batman always has a plan. So he, says, so he puts a plan in, in motion, which is to say he wants backups of his personality that will come into effect when this happens. So when he consciously renounces being Batman, then there will be this other Batman that will come into effect, which is the kind of insane Batman with the baseball bat, mm-hmm. that Batman instead of... Um, um, so, yeah, narratively, it's a, yeah, narratively, it's part of a way of dealing with, you know, the, the sort of diabolical uh, plans of this um, medical right. professional. Okay. All right. So that's, uh, that's more clear in my, in my head now. Okay. So when Batman is in this... Um, cave situation and he's uh, he's going through all of these uh, practices and rituals um you explain in your chapter that morrison is is talking about i i'm if i'm remembering correctly that he's talking about this process as being the initiation for for batman but mm-hmm. you note that morrison is using the term uh in a different way than a traditional Buddhist would. So could you talk more about that, about Morrison's more likely location of uh, actually Freemasonry as being the inspiration for for the usage of the term and not so much uh, Buddhism? Right. Um, yeah. So this was, this was one of the, the biggest sort of giveaways um, for me uh, was the, the way that uh, this, the language of initiation is used here um, in, the, in the Batman story. I wouldn't say... I mean, it is Freemasonry after a fashion. I mean, we're talking about, you know, esoteric co-Masonry or, um, you know, sort of theosophy, that that branch of things more than sort of standard craft Masonry um, as the, I, I think, the proximate origin of um, a lot of these ideas. So 
um, what I think the way that he's using it um, is is based on a kind of distinction that's that's drawn uh, sometimes more clearly than others uh, within Western esoteric contexts, often um, between ceremonial and real initiation, right? So there's initiation in the sense that uh, coming out of a, a Masonic milieu uh, where it's basically just a play um, that you're thrown into and you're the only one that hasn't got the script, right? So everyone else knows what's <laughs> what's going on, but you show up, you know, blindfolded and, uh, and there are all these uh, oaths to be sworn and so forth. Um, at least at the uh, the earlier, the lower level things. Um, so there's that notion of uh, initiation as being a sort of theater, a community theater. Um, and the the other side of it, uh, which is sometimes stated later uh, in, oh, I think uh, Annie Besant or Alice Bailey, some of these um, theosophist writers in the early part of the 20th century make this much more clear that that, that is a, a communication of a larger um, secret, which is the the so-called real initiation. When you grasp what the meaning of the the drama was, um, that's when the the consciousness of the the initiate is actually changed in some significant way. Um, so I think that's what when he's using initiation, he imagines at least uh, that that is something that happens in the initiation uh, that that he's describing. Uh, is that there's some significant change. It's not just a question of, you know, um, showing up and um, and going through a, a bit of a, a play, but that there's some significant thing that happens. Um, so I think that the, the other way of thinking about this, uh, and it's common to a lot of uh, initiatory traditions in a way, um, is that at least for some, and this is true in Buddhist uh, in some Buddhist initiations as well, um, in some of these traditions, there's a, a common thread is that the initiations themselves are modeled after some kind of death rebirth sequence, um, whereby the you know to put it in very sort of the most boring sort of sociological terms, right? The uh, previous identity of of uh, the, the person of the who is not yet initiated is set aside and the new uh, identity as a member of the group with various privileges and things comes into being. Um, that, that sequence though is obviously one that um, has a great deal of symbolic weight and, and people, and it lends itself very easily to the idea of being, you know, reborn as a different kind of person altogether, a different kind of entity. Um, so I think this is this is what he's working with, and, and certainly coming out of Crowley, who I think is a is a very um, obvious imp- uh, influence on uh, on Morrison. I talk about this a little bit in the chapter. Uh, you know, Crowley starts working his way through the the Golden Dawn um, graded system, mm-hmm. uh, but as far as we know, they the Golden Dawn had not even written; they had no text even for the top three or so of their ten uh, ten levels. Uh, and yet Crowley uh, claims that he underwent those initiations. So at some point, at least for him and certainly for the theosophists as well, these initiations become a thing that uh, um, that is entirely separate from the from any sort of a group ritual. Um, that it's a thing that the either with the hidden masters or the mm-hmm. you know the Mahatmas or whomever or the secret chiefs um, effect uh, in your own life in your own consciousness by whatever um, magical or remote means at their disposal um, that, that change the, the practitioner um, and allow you to mark a stage in your, you know, sort of uh, religious development. That said, Togal is not an initiation. Togal, uh, the, the thing that he describes consistently, Morrison describes consistently as initiation, is a practice that one does. You need initiation to do it. But um, that would be a thing that would happen previous to that. Um, and in fact, what you would get is an initiation that allows you to study the philosophical bases for the practices that you would do. And that would be another prerequisite that you would have to do um, before embarking on this retreat. Um, so I think the way that he uses um, the, the imagery and the way that he uses the, the language of initiation here is a, is a pretty clear giveaway um, that he's coming at it from a not from a Buddhist framework, because a Buddhist framework, I mean, there are initiations, they're important. Um, uh, 
they are pretty clearly understood to be, um, and this is hashed out in some Buddhist philosophical literature, the initiations don't make huge changes in, I mean, you're still going to have to practice, right? It's more or less, it's, it's often, you know, it's permission to begin to do a practice. And then 40 years down the road, you know, if you've been doing the thing every day, <laughs> then you get the result of it, you know, it'll finally come to fruition. But just getting the initiation, it's, you know, it's not going to do a whole lot. Because yeah. um, you've just got karma and all those things to deal with. And that takes, mm. that certainly takes time. Right. So right. the thinking goes. So it does seem to be a different type of process than you see a lot of times in Western esoteric uh, literature or accounts of initiatory experiences being a very personal um, um kind of over overwhelming type of thing for some people it's you know this uh, almost intense spiritual experience but yeah for for a buddhist it seems to be mm -hmm. just a part of the whole process you know the actual beginning of it that you just have to do that to move on and keep moving forward in your in your practice so yeah there's a, a definite difference there you mentioned crowley uh however mm -hmm. and how um those teachings about the abyss uh, play an important role in Batman's ego death. And it does seem, knowing what I know about the the idea, the concept of the abyss, it does seem to be fitting more with Batman's narrative uh, in this sense. Um, and you also note in your uh, chapter how the, the whole notion of the abyss that also goes against any type of, or not goes against, but it's just not the same as the Buddhist teachings uh would uh would view the experience so uh maybe you could talk a little bit more about how crowley influences morrison in this regard um about the differences between the the ideas surrounding quote unquote ego death and and, and how morrison seems hmm. to be leaning more towards crowley sure yeah I'll, um just, just to uh to retcon something that um, that I said a moment ago, I think it, it is it is worth noting that um, in earlier tantric literature, it is uh, there are ways in which these initiations are uh, some of them anyway are understood to be powerfully uh, emotionally affecting events. Okay. Um, in fact, the events in which um, you it is known that it has taken effect if the uh, initiate um, exhibits various, um, you know, strong reactions like sort of uh, shaking or weeping or mm -hmm. basically um, uh, it's, it's thought to be a, to induce a form of, of possession um, by a God uh, or gods. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the understanding would have, would have been at least at, at that point um, that you only really know if it works if the initiate has a, this really strong reaction. Um, you know, over time, of course, these things become massively routinized and you have the, the Dalai Lama giving initiations to hundreds of thousands of people in Central Park and, right, and no one's really checking to see if... Uh, you, you don't expect anyone to have, uh, you know, a sort of a fit or a seizure um, yeah. to, to authenticate that it's, that it's mm -hmm. taking root. Um, so it becomes routinized, uh, I think, is the um, is kind of the the key thing there. Um, so as to the, the question of the abyss, I think, um, yeah, with I think Crowley's influence on uh, on Grant Morrison is is quite extensive, and uh, and you you can think of it as coming in a, a couple of different ways. Uh, one is is directly in the sense that uh, that Morrison references Crowley at uh, some points uh, overtly uh, in the writing uh, and the other is via chaos magic um, which from my point of view is something that is uh, extremely indebted to Crowley uh, perhaps even more than a lot of chaos might uh, be inclined to admit um, so there's that on a philosophical slash practical level there's also the general idea of you know art as being itself a magical act and the kind of way that uh, Crowley would use, you know, the rites of Lucis and things like that as um, sort of dramatic performances as magic. And, and Morrison does similar things in terms of the way that uh, 
um, just hyper sigils and um, the way that they talk about um, the invisibles and some of these other uh, writing projects. Um, so the abyss, um, uh, which is also kind of where the the title of, um, that I pulled the, the idea of this sort of dark night of the soul, this kind of crisis, this existential crisis, um, is is a thing that um, that Crowley, I think, in particular, uh, imagines takes place, uh, you know, in the in the Sephiroth with on the sort of tree of life. Right there's the idea that you have uh, this fourth Sephiroth Da'at in some schemes, anyway. Um, that was there and it's like imploded or something. And so you can't make a, a clear, you have to cross a, a sort of a chasm where this Sephiroth used to be or Sephiroth used to be. Um, and so that it, that's the so-called abyss is this area that, um, that now there's sort of a gap in the track. Um, and so it's this interruption in the, in the continuity of memory, which I guess is the general way that we sort of construct personhood um that is would be so destructive to the idea of a person uh, if you have a very linear um narrative idea of the self as most of us presumably do that that gap in the in experience would be so instructive that it would be impossible to to put Humpty Dumpty together again you know on the on the other side of that even if one sort of reemerges um so to borrow sort of Crowley's length, the Humpty Dumpty thing is actually one of the bits that he uses in book four when he's talking about this. It's kind of a funny passage. Um, but so this idea of this being a really traumatic experience where one has this, you know, kind of almost a, a psychotic break or something and, um, and comes out of it, this can only be survived by this extreme compartmentalization of the personality or something. Uh, is something that Morrison, I think, gets uh, pretty directly from Crowley. I would say, though, that a couple of things here um, that, that spring immediately to mind. One is, again, it's hard to know with Crowley uh, as as well how much of this is a, you know, Crowley has, if you if you kind of Google around or you kind of go looking, there are like 30-something different, uh, you know, pseudonyms and things that he writes under He's got all these different occult mottos, right? Is he, you know, VVVVV or Therion or Baphomet or Perdurabo or Paramahamsa Shivaji or, you know, he's got like a, so many of these. Um, that, and arguably even the, the although it's a, a lower attainment, the sort of knowledge and conversation of the guardian angel, the holy guardian angel, um, can be a similar process of, um, probably vacillates on this idea, I think, but uh, that what in some ways what you're doing, or sometimes he thinks that what you're doing is externalizing some aspect of oneself um, from the, the subconscious so that you can access it directly with the conscious mind. So that the holy guardian angel is, is also arguably a, a similar phenomenon of sort of um, you know, fracturing the personality in kind of a deliberate way. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's kind of a recurring theme within, uh, within these traditions. Um, I think that that's something that, that Morrison latches onto. The idea that it's also supposed to be like a really harrowing experience uh, is something that I, I think you can understand why Morrison thinks so um, and why Crowley might think so. So the, the Buddhist idea behind this, uh, generally speaking, I mean, there, there are a range of ways that, that of course, that any tradition is, um, it's, it's always precarious um, to try to speak for the Buddhist view on anything, right? But um, is, does not generally include the idea that the dissolution of the ego is a harrowing, traumatic experience, um, because the doctrine is so foundational. And in fact, the doctrine is the thing that when properly understood is supposed to actually relieve one from suffering and, and furthermore explain how the, the world actually works, right? It's the thing that supposedly when you really understand it, then that's when the you know, one grasps how it is that karma works and, and all the, the, big, the big important questions anyway about the universe suddenly snap into place because you... Um, you begin to attribute things to their proper causes and conditions and, and you lose fixed ideas about things. And so you become much more flexible in, in the approach. 
Um, so it's not meant to be, at least as I understand it, it's not meant to be anything that's particularly frightening. If anything, it's a, it's a comfort. Um, and there are, within certain uh, tantric initiations, um, there are certainly death and rebirth sequences uh, that take place, although the initiate probably doesn't see them. It's all happening visualized in the mind of the, the uh, um, initiate tour. The initiating guru visualizes the whole thing, basically. Um, but you are taught um, as part of it, and this is pan-Indic tantric traditions, a, uh, your daily practice would then involve a sort of uh, reenactment of the initiation um, in which you would uh, visualize the destruction of your physical body um, and, and moving your consciousness to a, um, a visualized um, or a mind-made body. Um, so again, not considered to be a problem. It's just kind of the basic thing that you have to do is sort of uh, in order to uh, you know, the, the sort of buzzword in the in tantric context around this is that you have to become a god to worship a god. So in order to sort of shed your human limitations then, you know, you destroy the body with fire, you wash it with water, transfer your consciousness into this other pure form, uh, and that's the place from, when, uh, from whence you can conduct the rituals. Um, so, yeah, it's not, a, it's not a problem. It's also, in general sense, uh, broadly speaking, uh, in Tibet anyway, you might have other things to think about Zen or something, but in Tibet, this is a, an extremely gradual process. There's, it's not considered that you're going to have much of any way to experience it as a sudden rupture. In fact, you would have, you know, a great philosophical training. You learn various kinds of analytic meditation and you bounce back and forth between the analysis mode and the, and the sort of more what we might think of as standard meditative practices. And you kind of basically do those faster and faster. So you alternate them until you can kind of blend your experience um, of meditation and what they call post meditation. So that you begin to actually experience so-called normal life. Um, through this, you know, deconstructed frame. But that's, again, decades of work, um, mm. learning to switch back and forth between deep meditative states and real, quote unquote, real life until you kind of, you can blur the two. Um, so you're not going to be thrown off by it, um, is the thinking. Okay. Um, and the, the Tugal in particular, um, I mean, is, it's not about death at all. So it's not about initiation. It's also not about death. Um, the idea is that, you know, in addition to the, the energetic body, uh, the one with all the chakras and things like that, which is now fully absorbed into Western esoteric tradition, um, in Dzogchen, they, they also posit that there's a, a luminous body that exists uh, alongside that or in, in tandem with it. Uh, so there are all these channels that, that run separately from the chakras and things like that. Um, that can uh, convey light throughout the body, uh, which which allow us to perceive things, for instance, and um, that are sort of substrata of mind. And some of these run actually through the eyes. Um, and so when you lock yourself up in this cave, what you're actually seeing, supposedly, is the manifestation of this underlying uh, physiological, psychophysiological powers um, that are exiting the eyes to become visible because you've just eliminated all the other distractions that would normally um, get in the way. Um, so even though it's going to include uh, 50-ish terrifying deities at some point, by the time you get to that, you've just had this glorious light show for however long, right? Um, and again, at each point, basically just meditating along through it, going like, you know, oh, this is nice. This is some underlying level of my mind that's manifesting uh, you know, you've been training for this, the philosophical uh, grounding. Um, and then the deities, by the time you see them, you encounter them, you know, arrayed in a geometric mandala and everything's in its right place. Um, and so they're the, you know, 40, however many, people say 50 and 50, but it's not exactly 50 and 50. But they're, they're also the 50-ish peaceful deities that are there alongside them. And like, you know, it's all a big sort of balanced mm. Um, thing and not a harrowing death experience or a near-death experience. At least that's the, that's the idea. For what, uh, for what Morrison is doing and the kind of thing that Batman in the story, uh, you know, is trying to achieve of, you know, tasting death and making sure that he's got a plan for it all and, um, you know, basically nothing can, uh, 
you know, emerging as this kind of um, fearless, uh, unflappable, you know, even more so than the usual Batman uh, figure from having done this is, uh, yeah, it's very much more uh, on the existential crisis mode uh, than the, you know, fantastic uh, light show um, in the cave uh, thing that would be what, what an advanced extremely, I would I, I'm going to stress this extremely, extremely advanced Buddhist practitioner would, uh, would be doing. Right. Yes. There's obviously a, a, a mixing of different, uh, traditions and systems happening in mm-hmm. this, in this story, even though it's put into a quote unquote Buddhist context, there are all these mm-hmm. other contexts as well happening within within this uh, this whole uh, narrative about what's happening to Batman, of course. So, and you point mm-hmm. this out that Morrison is using, you know, all of these different elements and and is drawing upon various sources for for their story. And mm-hmm. as you mentioned, they are a chaos magician. Uh, who views their own writing as a magical act or a ritual, and and it's and this writing is shaping their own experiences. Also, the readers who are engaging with it, it's also shaping their experiences. Mm-hmm. So he has, or pardon me, they have a uh, a very um, uh, broad uh, viewpoint of you know what is actually actually happening uh, when you're creating something. Um, that goes much uh, much further than how you know uh, just a quote unquote basic way of of, of approaching you know creating a, a story. So, um, mm-hmm. and as you also mentioned, comic books are already known. The whole genre is already known for containing occult themes. You mentioned uh, Promethea and Invincibles, and you know those are. And it's not a secret either. I mean, the, the the authors talk about you know how how they're inspired by occult themes. So we can then, of course, see this as uh, as we mentioned before, a culture. This appropriating all of these concepts into popular culture and comics. You know, that's that's one area where this uh, where this is happening. Um, and Morrison uh, uses. Of course, the chaos magic and the Tibetan Buddhism, uh, even if one isn't specifically aware of these themes when you're reading and engaging with the material, it's it's there. It's it's everywhere. As Christopher Partridge says, you know, it, a culture is everywhere. So and it's not just Batman. It's other other comics that are that are doing this, such as. Uh, recently, WandaVision came out. Of course, they're talking about chaos magic and WandaVision. Uh, Doctor Strange is using uh, more ritual, I guess, ritual magic, ceremonial magic, maybe uh, in in that film and in those comics. So, what are your uh, thoughts about this syncretic way of using uh, Buddhist philosophy? Uh, in, in this particular case with Batman and the bricolage that takes place with the chaos magic. And we see this, now we're seeing it more and more and more in Western popular culture. What are your, mm. what are your thoughts about that? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating uh, development from my point of view. I, I find the, the, I find the entire notion of, uh, of chaos magic or in discordianism, you know, in some ways of the, uh, the more sort of Zen heavy, like American version of it. Um, I find it entirely fascinating, partially because at least for me, I'm, uh, I'm often, I find myself particularly interested in, uh, the, the question of people's subjective commitments, uh, versus their ritual practices. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it is, Anecdotal, uh, I guess, but uh, generally, if you're on the right message boards and things like that, understood that a decent chunk of the people coming out of the, the chaos magic scene, you know, so the old guard, um, went off into uh, Tibetan Buddhism into the in the nineties, um, and in particular into the Nyingma, the the old the name literally means the old school, 
um, which is the one that has Dzogchen as the, as the highest teachings. Um, so, I mean, I, I think just the, the notion of having, you know, these Buddhist centers potentially, uh, you know, fit, maybe not filled with, but populated to some extent by people who are actually on some, you know, background uh, process, um, who are thinking of what they're doing is sort of chaos magic, and they're just adopting a paradigm for a you know a certain point, a certain time. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it is, is entirely fascinating, and it's um, it's not so different, I guess, from the um, the kind of thing that I was looking at uh, last week at the um, at the talk that I did about these sort of Buddhist traditionalists um, who are similarly coming at it with a different kind of meta frame, mm-hmm. uh, practicing Buddhism, but um, with this this other idea in mind. Um, so, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm personally, um, I, I'm for it. I want, I want more of it, uh, wherever you can get it, uh, just for my own, uh, edification. Um, where do I think it comes from? Um, I think there are a couple of things that are, you know, it makes it hard to, to pin down. There's a bit of a, a pizza effect or however you want it to think of a, of this, because so much of, the contemporary occult milieu is already kind of shot through with Buddhist ideas. You know, the theosophists do this. Crowley is super into it. Um, Kenneth Grant, especially if you go off into sort of chaotic circles, Kenneth Grant's a big deal. And you have Lam with the various uh, sort of alien thing that Crowley supposedly contacted, Mm -hmm. um, has his Tibetan connections. Um, I think the Tibetan Buddhist traditions in particular wind up being especially attractive to some people for, for a number of reasons. One is that they are at least represented and, and perhaps with some, um, some good reasons uh, as being more quote unquote sort of shamanic or, or uh, inclined towards practical magic than, uh, than a lot of other Buddhist traditions that we have um, access to in the West. Um, which is not to say there isn't plenty of like practical magic and stuff in a lot of these other traditions too, but the Tibetan Tibetan Buddhism is, is very Tantra forward. If we want to think of it in those terms, um, that it was just so uh, mainstream uh, that by the time Buddhism went to Tibet, it was the height of the time in India where Tantric Buddhism was like really in the, um, in its heyday. And so it never really became a, it wasn't like a, it was esoteric in the sense that you had to take initiations to get access to it. Um, but not in the sense that anybody doubted that that's kind of, that it was still the normal thing that everybody did. Um, so all these kind of uh, practices that deal with, you know, um, consciously navigating the dying process or uh, working with lucid dreaming or sexual yogas or, um, even sort of like sorcery and sort of like aggressive magic, these kinds of things, or wealth practices, all this stuff is like, is very um, easily accessible um, for, uh, for a lot of people in a Tibetan Himalayan Buddhist context. Um, so there's that, it's also late to the scene in the West. Um, the actual, like getting any real information about uh, Tibetan Buddhism is, is a little bit uh, long in coming. So partially what that means is then, um, and it only really happens after the, the PRC, after the Communist Party and uh, Cultural Revolution starts to do its work, its renovation um, in Tibet. So it's very easy for people, especially if you don't know the history very well, to think, you know, Tibet was a sort of pre-modern Shangri-La, uh, hidden mountain kingdom ruled by sort of divine Dalai Lama figures. Uh, and that... You know, it's inaccessible now, right? So that that's gone. So you can't necessarily even even if they go to Tibet and say, well, okay, Tibetans are just kind of like anybody else. That, you know, they're not all actually walking around, uh, you know, working wonders. They're not all thaumaturgy. Some of them are just shopkeepers. Um, it's easy enough to chalk that up to, well, that's just the that's Mao's fault, right? It's not because presumably it used to be that way. Um, they also have really good press. Uh, traditionally speaking, that's, uh, you know, they have very positive uh, media representation. Um, and, and and not a lot of history of uh, Tibetans don't tend to get too excised over being portrayed inaccurately in the media, as like a number of other traditions might. So they're very convenient for Dr. Strange to go mm-hmm. to Tibet. 
um, or Batman or whatever, right? Because the Tibetans, generally speaking, they're not really going to care all that much. <laughs> yeah, there, there's not much. I mean, and for some reasons also, you know, you can understand why other groups might. There's no, but there's no real equivalent of like Indiana Jones and Temple of Doom for Tibetan Buddhism, right? Where it, where it looks like it's you know doing human sacrifices and tossing people into lava and eating monkey brains, right? It's kind of um, the Tibetans, generally speaking, they're kind of eh, it's it's fine, <laughs> <laughs> and they rely on it in a way. I mean, the cachet of the uh, you know the Tibetan international cachet is predicated on Buddhism substantially um, and on uh, foreigners having a positive view of this. Sure. Um, so I think, I think that's, uh, that's a lot of it. Um, it's, it's very easily accessible in some ways. Um, in terms of actual content, you know, I think coming at it from either from, you know, Crowley directly, uh, although he's very underinformed. For, for various reasons about uh, Tibetan Himalayan Buddhism. Um, actually, funnily enough, I, I brought this up once to a, a friend of mine who's a, a fellow mite. And um, so, yeah, I, I was talking once to, about this to a friend of mine who's a, a fellow mite. And, uh, and he said something I, I thought was kind of interesting, which is that, uh, that he was glad that Crowley had not really uh, got access to or, or understood um, Tibetan Buddhism very much. Um, because if he had, then probably then there wouldn't have been Thalema that Crowley would have just looked at that and been like, oh, yeah, this is pretty much what, this is what I'm after. And it was to that. Right. Um, and right. so, you know, we, we would all have we'd been robbed of all the uh, <laughs> these fascinating developments. Things happen um, for a reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but so I think for, for Kayotes and, uh, and coming out, so Crowley, I mean, the, the connection I was trying to make there is, you know, Crowley has these extremely anti rational tendencies uh, in his writing, kind of coming out of romantic uh, notions, but also, um, you know, there's something that feeds into, uh, into chaos magic uh, extensively, right? So Crowley is, you know, you know what is it, uh, enough of because, be it damned for a dog and so on, right? And the chaos, magis, uh, chaos magicians pick up with, you know, nothing is true and everything's permitted. Okay. Belief is a tool. Um, so I think that, People coming out of that milieu look at the Buddhist deconstruction of, um, well, basically everything, and the 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 emphasis on the kind of limits of language, uh, the the idea that, um, at least within a lot of contexts, uh, that that what philosophy is for is to basically walk you right up to the brink of what you can do with language, and then sort of like, then you sort of topple over the edge into the uh, the experience of of whatever you're trying to get to. Um, that kind of anti-rationalism, uh, in a way, uh, they imagine as being commensurate. Um, and so I think more than many other traditions, perhaps, the, the Buddhism seems the closest thing to hand. And as I said, it's baked in from the beginning, because if you have, you know, theosophy and, and Crowley and things like that feeding into these traditions already, um, it could seem like coming home to some extent, yeah. right? You're, you're combining um, things that are already pretty close together. It's also true that um, a couple of other things, I think. One is that within, more so than any of the other forms of, uh, of tantric traditions that I'm aware of, uh, the, the Tibetan Buddhist tradition is pretty clear that um, a lot of these practices, uh, even down to things like, you know, how many chakras are there, what colors are they, um, which deities you're working with, and how many you know, arms have they got and all these kinds of things, what the mantras are. So many of these things are pretty obviously arbitrary. Um, that is to say they vary substantially from text to text and from lineage to lineage. Um, and Tibetans are well aware of this. Um, and so they, uh, it can look a lot like paradigm shifting, I guess, in a way, if you're working from one system where there's four chapters and the next one that's got eight, um, and, you know, you're doing one one day or one in the morning and the other one in the afternoon and, and you just sort of mix it up. Uh, that that's a thing that would be like reasonably uh, well established and uh, and very much gives the sense that these are things that are um, that are not meant to be grounded in the same kind of empirical reality that people, I think, 
generally in an occult milieu, if you ask them, they probably think they've got seven chakras and like that that's an actual uh, physiological fact. Uh, Tibetan Buddhist tradition generally isn't going to go in for that. Um, there are, you know, as many as like 22 in some in some contexts and, yeah. and you know, just three in others and uh-huh. anything can happen in between. Um, and the importance is just kind of work the system as you inherit it, um, you know, what it, how it's taught in the lineage. Mm-hmm. Um, and don't correct it or try to bring it into line with anything else. Just, mm-hmm. you know, and right. try to uh, work within one paradigm, if you want to think yeah. of it in those terms. Um, so I think that's very familiar to people. Um, the other, two other things, I, one is that there is also within the Nyingma tradition, which is the one that all these Dzogchen texts come out of, um, there, there's a thing called terma, which is, is the idea of these are hidden, these are teachings that the theory goes um, that in the 8th century, there's an Indian teacher who brings, first brings Buddhism to, uh, or establishes it in Tibet, um, and he's a second Buddha, basically. Padmasambhava is his name. So he's, he's a full-on tantric uh, Buddhist master. Um, and he initiates the king and the whole court um, into, and some of the queens uh, into Buddhism. Um, and knowing that, you know, over time that the circumstances are going to change and that people, different kinds of teachings will be necessary, implants in their mental continua teachings that will be, or the ability to understand teachings that are written in code that will be pulled out of mountainsides or something later on. Um, he gives them, he like scatters all these teachings amongst these 25 courtiers um, and throughout the landscape. And so that at various points as needed, um, these teachings are quote unquote recovered um, and they are exactly suited to the time. And the newer, the better, because the newer they are, the more likely it is that that means that they are, they were meant to have been recovered exactly for our present circumstances mm. and they haven't had time to get sort of like corrupted or whatever that there's, you know, um, so that, that kind of emphasis on like the, the, the newest thing is actually something that you, um, that you can find uh, and, and on, and on things being adapted to the present circumstances um, is something that's also built in, in particular to this school um, that I think for a lot of, you know, it's kind of chaos, chaos magician types, I would, would appreciate. And what was the name of this school again? Your microphone was uh, a little bit uh, blocked, and I couldn't hear the word that you said. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, Nyingma. Okay. N-Y-I-N-G-M-A. And it literally just means the ancient school. Okay. So, um, you know, the development of the school is basically what happens is um, Buddhism comes to Tibet in two phases. So the first is this 8th century um, when the king imports it. Um, and they bring in this guy, Padmasambhava, who uh, founds the school. There is, uh, after a couple of generations, um, basically a palace coup, and a new regime comes into power who think that the monasteries are getting too powerful, and so the story goes. Um, And so they um, sort of suppress Buddhism, and that means um, that after a a while, the, the ordination lineages get compromised. And so uh, in the 11th century, 10th, 11th century, a new sort of Buddhist dynasty comes into power and they re-import Buddhism from India because they want to reestablish the, the monastic lineages. So then you have at that point um, a proliferation of new schools and the previous uh, Buddhists that were there become the old school. Okay. I see. Um, and that's also where these terma come in because when the – you know, Buddhism has been developing in India for a couple of centuries in the meantime, and all kinds of things like Kundalini Yoga have developed, which weren't really there in the first, uh, when it first came around. Okay. Um, so if we're being cynical about it anyway, this is the, the idea is that what happens is these new teachings come in um, from India uh, in the 10th, 11th century, and the old school um, say, well, well, of course, yeah, we have those too. And they, they were just like buried in these people to like reincarnating um, you know that, and we pull them from out of mountains, and uh, we have these all these coded texts. All the all the stuff you've got, we've already got it. Um, and in fact, now we have all this Zogchen stuff, which you haven't got. So, like that's why it's extra special. Uh, I see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, with so there's regard- a very practical efficacy. <laughs> I see. Yes, 
<laughs> I see. But with regard to the Westerners who are approaching this, uh, as you mentioned before about this, uh, the idea for the for the Buddhists that they, you know, these things that are hidden that you're finding at a you know at a particular point, and it's the new thing that you're finding that this is like an innovative type of thing that is happening within this system. It seems like for the Westerners that are using like either chaos magic, for example, that that there's also kind of a pragmatic thing happening there as well that, you know, you're, you're mixing and blending things together and making something new that is useful. It works for you, you know, and if it doesn't work for you, then you leave it. So it's, I don't know if it's the same type of approach to the practice or the, the, the work what, that you're trying to do. Uh, is it as pragmatic for the Buddhists as it is for the, for the chaos? Mm. I, I, well, I've said. Or is it really not comparable? My, my inclination is to say no, okay. but there's a, there's a way in which, you know, you could argue that it is. I think the, the, what I what I imagine happens is kind of this in both in both instances. A lot of these things do ride on the prestige of whether they quote unquote work or not. Um, has to do a lot with the prestige of whoever is propounding uh, the traditions in question, um, and that I think is also true in with the terma. So, like lots of these lots of alleged terma, the, it means treasure. So, lots of these uh, you know treasures are uh, recovered. Um, which are not universally accepted as being legitimate. They're more likely to be considered legitimate if it comes from somebody who's like from a famous lineage Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, if they're very well written or if they become really popular for any number of other, um, you know, kind of idiosyncratic reasons, but um, they're not all accepted. There's a kind of authentication from within the tradition. And um, I think though, that's not terribly different from the kinds of things that are going to happen in, yeah. you know, chaos magic circles yeah. that, you know, for all the, the rhetoric around uh, everything being based on, um, you know, success is your proof. Like whether you have success or not is going to depend to some substantial degree on how invested you are in it and um, mm-hmm. how credible you find the practice to be to begin with. And, and that's going to depend on who you heard it from or where you learned it. And, yeah. Um, there is an authentication process that's happening on both sides. It's maybe not happening in this by the same precise um, mechanisms, but mm. um, in some ways, I think they're more contiguous than than either side would probably uh, like to like to think. <laughs> Interesting phenomenon. Uh, before we uh, before I move on with the next question that I had for you, uh, you mentioned that you gave a, a lecture recently, and I do want to mention that here uh, because the lecture uh, will be made public uh, sometime in the future, and probably by the time that this video is uploaded, it will probably be available. Um, the student organization of the HHP Center at the University of Amsterdam, that's the History of Hermetic Philosophies and Related Currents, uh, uh, invited Joel to come give a lecture, and he was talking about uh, left-hand path uh, traditions, and well, not a tradition, but a, a particular um, system, I guess you could say. Um, and it was really a very, very interesting lecture. So not to get off too much on a tangent, but I did want to mention it here. Uh, I believe that the link will be made uh, uh live on or not live but be made available on the channel of the hhp and all of that information i'll put in the description box i'll double check to make sure i have the right information and i'll make sure that that is there so that people can uh view that as well because it was a very interesting interesting talk that you gave and it also i guess links these two discussions in that we have a blending of different traditions that are that are going on uh, with even though in in the other lecture the the people within the system are kind of wanting to not claim Western uh, traditions and and, and, and occult uh, uh, schools and systems of thought they're really they really are there and they really are making use of them so I guess it's kind of uh, linking these two uh, these two discussion our discussion in your lecture. Um, 
linking them together in that way. So I just wanted to make note of that so people can can check you out there as well. Uh, but my last question for, for you is where people can find you if they want to know more about your research and your work. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, so um, I have, well, probably the easiest way to do this, I think, um, would be that you can just uh, put my name into Twitter. And then from there, there's a link. Uh, to my Humanities Commons page, uh, links out to my academia.edu and um, and so forth. Right. Uh, I'm collecting some of these things, uh, lectures and so on, also on a, I have a YouTube. Um, but if you use my name, you get like a real estate guy. So <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll just send you a, a link. It's, it's too late, I guess, for me to actually get uh, the, the old school user uh, YouTube slash your name page. Right, um, yeah. That guy's got it. Changed. <laughs> okay. Um, but I will make sure that all of those links are, are included as well, your YouTube. Mm -hmm. And the if people want to read this chapter uh, for themselves about Batman, that is uh, available on academia.edu. I'd like to thank you, uh, Joel, for a very interesting discussion today and also a very fun discussion. Uh, anytime we're talking about comics and things like that, I'm I'm not a comic geek, I guess, but I'm close. I'm close to to being a comic <laughs> geek. So, uh, but I just had a really fun time talking with you today, and thank you so much for making the time uh, for this discussion. Um, and I don't know if there's anything else that you'd like to add at the if you have any other thoughts. Um I, I would say, I guess, you know, one thing that um, that if it wasn't clear earlier, just to sort of uh, to put too terribly fine a point on it, um, I wouldn't put it past uh, Morrison to. My point is not to say that he got all these things wrong necessarily. I wouldn't. I wouldn't uh, be surprised if he is um, well informed enough to know that that's. Uh, that he's using these things and uh, he's taking some creative license um, with them. So I think that that's, uh, that's one point that I would, I would like to make sure that um, that's out there. Uh, I, I don't, I don't like to, to put myself in the position of, um, you know, of running around correcting uh, so-called wrong notions about uh, Buddhism and popular culture and so on. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's much more interesting to see what, what people do with them. And, mm -hmm. um, and maybe even in many cases, uh, you know, assume that they may be doing those things uh, in an informed way. And, um, and I think with someone like, with someone like Grant Morrison, that is, it seems extremely likely uh, because he, he does refer to others of these practices and other contexts, you know, it's yeah. not as if he is unaware of all the things that happen in the middle right, um, right, necessarily. Right. Um, he even shows Batman and other lines doing these things. So, mm. well, in any in any case, if the people are uh, people reading these are inspired enough to go looking for it, then they'll start to learn more about it themselves. And of course, there's mm -hmm. creative license uh, being being taken here. I mean, this is this is making for a, a really fascinating and creative story. So, you know, you don't have to be mm -hmm. strictly adhering to all of the rules in that in that regard. It makes it fun to. To be uh, to be freer with with all of these things and mix and match them as as it fits the story as well. I mean, you have a particular idea about how the story should go. So, uh, but thank you for exactly. pointing that out. That is a good point to make. It's not my intention either to to say no, you're wrong. <laughs> not at all. It's yeah. just a. Um, I think what your uh, what the chapter that 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 you wrote does is. It, it just offers a, a broadening of the perspectives uh, in, in that sense. So I think that's a good thing. And uh, it's always it's always good to have a, f a, a fun little access point to be able to learn new new things about new uh, things that maybe you didn't know about before or that you had been interested in, but you didn't really have a, a way of accessing that material in a in a way that's you know, just, just very enjoyable. So 
again, I thank you for uh, for writing that chapter. And the the way it all came about is kind of a funny story as well. That <laughs> the last minute they kind of pushed you, pushed you, pushed you to <laughs> to write about about Batman. So it's a, it's all good. So I I really uh, really enjoyed the reading your your work, and I enjoyed talking with you today. So thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me on. Great.